Dr. Alex Capano, Chief Science Officer at Eco Fiber and Ananda Health. We work with Biotics to bring them their FS15, FS20, and FS Relief roll-on products from our farms and laboratory in Kentucky. And I'm, today I'm going to talk about what is the scientific evidence behind CBD and the use of hemp extract as therapeutic options across different disease states? And what is the opportunity for this to also be just a, uh, a part of a really nice wellness routine? I'm sure you have all had some sort of introduction to the endocannabinoid system, CBD or cannabis in general. So I don't want to spend too much time on that, but I'll do a quick review of the main points of topics. So the ECS or the endocannabinoid system, we all have one, all of our pets even have one, and it's made up of two types of receptors, CB1 receptors that are very abundant in the brain and central nervous system, and CB2 receptors that exist in the brain but are more abundant throughout the periphery, specifically on immune cells. So these receptors of the ECS are responsible for a host of different homeostatic functions. They are going to regulate mood, breath, sleep-wake cycle, inflammation, immune response, hormonal balance, digestion, and more. So the endocannabinoid system was actually discovered after the first cannabinoid was discovered. So it's named for cannabinoids because cannabinoids work and interact with the endocannabinoid system. So cannabinoids are THC, that's the molecule present in cannabis plants that's in very high concentrations in a marijuana plant and can cause intoxication, but it's very low in concentrations in a hemp plant. So a hemp plant uh, will not cause intoxication. Another example of a cannabinoid is CBD. So CBD is kind of the, the hot molecule of the day, and I think it has um, pretty good reason to be considered that. So that is a molecule that has a lot of therapeutic opportunity, but will not cause intoxication. So CBD, THC, two main cannabinoids. They're the most abundant and most well-known and most well-studied, but they're not the only two. There's a host of other cannabinoids within cannabis plants. And again, cannabinoids work on the endocannabinoid system. What's really interesting is that there are not only phytocannabinoids like CBD and THC. Our brain makes endogenous cannabinoids. Our body makes endogenous cannabinoids known as 2-AG and anandamide. So we have this ECS, we're making our own cannabinoids, but we can also get plant-derived phytocannabinoids to alter the function or improve the function of the ECS. I spoke a little bit about the difference between hemp and what we call marijuana. In the US, marijuana is a cannabis plant with 0.3% THC or more, or really more, more than 0.3% THC. So again, that's the intoxicating compound. Hemp is a cannabis plant with 0.3% THC or less. That's the only difference. So they're really legal buckets, but there is an important distinction when it comes to therapeutic options, because if you have an oil derived from a hemp plant, it's going to be more abundant in CBD and lower in THC. Next, I will talk about full spectrum versus isolated CBD or cannabidiol. So those are the two main options of products you're going to see on the market. Full spectrum means it is CBD with at least a little bit of THC present in a hemp plant, enough for therapeutic outcomes, but not enough to intoxicate. But it also has a host of other biologically active compounds in it, including other cannabinoids, but also uh, terpenes and flavonoids that contribute to anti-inflammatory effects that boost the effects of CBD and THC through something called the entourage effect and really promote the best response of a CBD product. Isolate is what it sounds like. It's just isolated CBD. It's the pure crystallized molecule. does have therapeutic potential, but less so for a number of reasons than full spectrum, which I'll get um, into detail about soon. And um, you know, a nice analogy to think of is full spectrum is kind of like an orange. So you eat the entire orange. It's going to be have greater bioavailability. It has more nutrients than just vitamin C. Whereas isolate is like a packet of vitamin C powder that you may put in a drink. 
it's really going to have only the benefits of vitamin C and you still may not be able to harness them as much as you would when you eat it in an orange like a whole food. Um, the history and controversy I think is important to touch on because I want people to know that these are compounds that have been used therapeutically throughout all of documented human history and specifically within the United States until 1937. They were um, probably the most prescribed medication overall and certainly the number one prescribed main pain medication until 1937. In 1937, something called the Marijuana Tax Act came into, uh, was introduced and it passed really because of political reasons. It passed largely due to influence from the opioid lobby and the development of morphine, um, and really due to some, some pretty sick realities based in racism. So the reason I bring that up is we need to understand that cannabinoids were never outlawed or, or you know, eliminated through medical practice because they weren't effective or because they were dangerous. It's really just steeped in some major cultural and political baggage that we've seen throughout the 20th and the beginning of the 21st century. Currently though, hemp derived products are federally legal. They are yet to be regulated. So there's a lot of noise in a very crowded space. And there's even an opportunity to buy products that are at the best case scenario, um, kind of empty of active cannabinoids and worst case scenario might have some dangerous substances in them such as uh, fertilizers and um, molds or microbes or even you know, uh, some, some really harmful chemicals. But luckily through biotics, you have um, a lot of reassurance that they've done their due diligence and there's a lot of quality control in these products that you'll learn about today, specifically FS20, FS15, soft gels and the roll-on. So again, the ECS regulates all of these different bodily functions and contributes to homeostasis every second, every minute, every hour of the day. And this is important to really, really get your head around because when you recognize that the ECS regulates all of these different functions, you can then see the opportunity for therapeutic intervention throughout multiple clinical conditions and disease states. And it feels less like snake oil um, and more like a something that really works. And, you know, because there is the, the risk of this being kind of seen as a panacea. And I wanna make sure that while I'm excited about all of the different potential, you know, this isn't going to be the compound that cures male pattern baldness, um, unfortunately, for a lot of people who were hoping that would be the case. It doesn't, doesn't fix everything for everyone. And just really driving that home that if your ECS is, is dysregulated, it has um, negative outcomes throughout really every organ and organ system in your body. And particularly with that underlying cause of inflammation, because the ECS really controls inflammation. On the left hand side, we see THC and CBD as phytocannabinoids, but also these other cannabinoids CBN, CBC, CBG, CBD, et cetera. So I just want to make sure that while CBD is really, really the powerhouse right now. It's not only about CBD. You need these other compounds to contribute to something called the entourage effect. The entourage effect means that full spectrum products promote a greater therapeutic response overall, and that you can reach that therapeutic peak at a lower dose than you would with an isolated CBD. And that is, again, because of the entourage effect. The left hand side of the screen, you're going to see refined isolated CBD. On the right hand side, examples of cannabinoids as well as terpenes and flavonoids that exist in the plant. There are also some synthetic options out there. And I wanna be very clear that synthetic cannabinoids um, do not work the same way as phytocannabinoids. So they, one, don't have um, the potential to elicit the same therapeutic response in, in a positive way than do phytocannabinoids. And there's been some interesting systematic reviews on this, but they also have a much higher frequency of adverse effects and their safety profile is not as reassuring as phytocannabinoids are. So I really, really urge people to stay away from synthetics and to go to phytocannabinoids, whether 
Um, ideally, it's full spectrum, but even isolated phytocannabinoid is going to be better than synthetic. So here's, here's what I'm talking about when I talk about the full spectrum versus isolate. In the middle, you'll see something called broad spectrum. That's an option that's kind of in the middle in that it has more than just isolated CBD in it, but it doesn't have any THC in it. THC is the next most important compound next to CBD and is certainly the most powerful contributor to the entourage effect. So full spectrum really is going to be best. And what this means is that you'll reach a higher uh, response overall with a full spectrum, that peak is going to be higher than with an isolate, and you're going to reach it at a lower dose. Now, I think generally we as practitioners want to use the lowest effective dose for really anything out there, but this is particularly important of CBD products because lower doses mean lower risks. And again, while this has an excellent safety profile, the higher the dose, the higher the risk of side effects, such as drowsiness, um, or dry mouth or um, dizziness. I mean, these are pretty mild side effects, but they are almost uh, never happen with low doses. Number two, drug interactions are possible. I'll talk about that in detail, but they really only occur at higher doses. Um, and liver injury, this is hepatically metabolized, really only occurs with pre-existing liver injury, but also at much higher doses. So the lowest dose, you are going to have lower risk of side effects, lower risk of drug interactions, and lower risk of any liver issues. So let's talk about why people are using CBD and hemp extract. Mostly it's going to be pain, sleep, and mood. Those are really the top three reasons people are using this. But I really want to talk about inflammation overall and the opportunity there, and sexual health, because Frankly, that is an area of health that I think is too often ignored, especially when it comes to our female patients. And there's a really big opportunity for the use of hemp-derived CBD oil in sexual health. So inflammation. Uh, cannabinoids and the ECS are going to regulate inflammation throughout the body. I think I'm in good company here with this group when I say that inflammation is really the underlying cause of almost all chronic disease. Uh, we see it with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, MS, but we even see a link with depression and certainly with pain. So the CBD, the ECS play major, major, major roles in inflammation and not only decreasing it acutely, but really decreasing it and keeping it regulated over time. And to me, that is motivating to make CBD a part of a daily wellness regimen to hopefully prevent the development of these degenerative diseases over time. I mean, that's certainly a motivation for me to use it. And I think um, as we look more into the science and mechanisms of action, you'll be motivated as well. So we took some evidence from uh, Temple University's lab where they looked at rodent brains and we're treating with cannabidiol before traumatic brain injury or, or hypoxic ischemia in different tissues. And they found that if they treated the animal before injury, the injury was um, so much less profound and recovery was that much better. Now, if they dosed with CBD after injury, it certainly helps, but not to the point of where it was already on board before injury. Um, this, and, and it limited the spread of ischemia throughout the brain and throughout the heart as well. So this was a really, really exciting opportunity. We're hearing a lot of anecdotal evidence from our gerontologists and our neurologists um, who actually treat humans. So we are doing a clinical trial with Eastern Virginia Medical School and Old Dominion University, are actually doing two. So the first one, we'll look at agitation in dementia patients. That's going to be all etiologies, so mostly Alzheimer's patients, but really any underlying cause of dementia. This will be a double-blind placebo-controlled crossover study. And we're going to be using one or two of the FS15 soft gels twice a day. Um, so depending on tolerance, one to two soft gels BID. The intervention six weeks with a two week washout period. And we're going to be measuring the response via caregiver survey, but also via wearable technology data. So we're going to be looking at heart rate, um, blood pressure, limb movement, tone, particular words that may be signs of agitation in each patient. This will be individualized, uh, pitch, 
et cetera. So really these different objective measures of agitation. And we're only also going to be assessing the caregiver. Does this improve caregiver burden? Because, you know, I'm sure you're all familiar, we as practitioners see that our caregivers have a much higher rate of anxiety, depression, and even suicide. So we really want to help the whole um, family here. Secondly, we'll be looking at FS15 soft gels within mild cognitive decline. So very different patient population from the dementia study. This is really everybody else who is concerned about the effects that aging has on our brain. So we'll be looking at um, 100 participants. This will be randomized placebo-controlled trial again and blinded. They are going to be taking one to two FS15 soft gels twice a day, depending on what they prefer. And we'll look at volumetric MRIs at baseline and at 12 months and see whether or not we can objectively measure a reduction in myocognitive decline through these full spectrum hemp products. Um, there will also be um, you know, survey workups that are standard of practice within that clinic that will be compared at baseline in 12 months as well. So this is kicking off this year. We are all really excited about it. And there's really, really good preclinical models that influence that this will be successful. And then I wanna talk about pain. So inflammation is certainly the underlying cause of pain. And we know that phytocannabinoids and CBD in general suppress inflammation and even um, act as anti-nociceptive agents uh, through multiple different mechanisms and, and probably some we have yet to discover. This is also uh, came from the influence of Temple University's lab that's specifically Drs. Uh, Ron Tuma and Sarah Jean Ward out of Temple. Sarah Ward looked at chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy in rodents and found that treating them before uh, using these chemotherapy agents reduced or even eliminated the development of peripheral neuropathy overall. And this is a, a really horrible condition for patients to develop with chemotherapy because if they are, you know, in remission from their cancer, they can still have a very debilitating condition due to treatment. There's not a whole lot of options. Um, opioids are an option and they, they don't work for very long and they certainly come with a lot of risks. And um, sometimes people can't even finish their treatment because the, the peripheral neuropathy is so terrible. So we really need better options here. And it was very successful in rodents. So we are doing a clinical trial along with our partners at breastcancer.org um, to evaluate this in patients. And we have actually um, worked with the FDA, uh, the CMO of breastcancer.org to get approval for this study. We will do the same and are uh, in the process of the same with the dementia studies as well. That's really first for hemp extract companies. And, and that's how you can really rest assured that Biotics picked a good partner um, in who they have working with them to develop these products. Because the FDA said, sure, you can use it in your study. Um, I want to point out here that in the rodent study, and we've seen this time and time again across the world uh, and across different labs and across different studies, but just more reason that CBD, when paired with even a little bit of THC, let alone those other cannabinoids, terpenes and flavonoids and full spectrum products, you need a much lower dose when it's in combination than with CBD alone. Um, so this is some nice data, thanks to Dr. Ward from Temple. Another thing is that we're going to see this U-shaped dose response curve, inverted U, I always say U-shaped. It's a bell-shaped dose response curve. And the importance here is to realize that more is not always better. Um, CBD, we see maybe a second peak after the first peak, but the second peak is lower. And it's also that you're taking a lot more of the product. So the more you of CBD you get into your cells, it may actually not work as well as it does at lower doses. Um, and also you're going to be at higher risk for complications, adverse effects, and liver injury. And again, drug interactions. So less is more, and um, we are really, really seeing a higher uh, therapeutic range within a lower dose. So this clinical trial will also use 100 participants. It's going to be a randomized uh, double-blind trial. They will again be using the FS15 soft gels. There's going to be three soft gels uh, three times a day. That's the dose, the ideal dose or the upper limit dose in the study. I, I personally think it is 
likely too high, but um, there was a little bit of arguing. So we'll see how it goes. I think over time it will be well, to well tolerated, but what I'm curious to see is that I, I do believe you need lower doses to actually prevent or treat CIPN in humans. Um, what's also interesting is that breastcancer.org, along with uh, Ananda Health, who's providing biotics with their products, we did a survey study and found that all of these uh, patients are using CBD products. They don't know where they're getting it from. They don't. We don't know the quality of it. A lot of them aren't speaking to their practitioners about it. And if they are speaking to them, they're not getting any answers. So they're going on Dr. Google to get, you know, any sort of answers. They're going to the gas station to get these products and, and you know, who knows what's actually inside this. So we really need to do a better job as practitioners to be able to answer them questions and to provide them with high quality products. Because again, this is an unregulated market and there's, uh, you know, stuff out there that's really just a waste of money, but there's also stuff out there that could be dangerous. Another opportunity when we talk about inflammation and pain is opioid reduction. So this is an, an issue that's near and dear to my heart. And I wanna say that this is an opportunity for four reasons. One, we know that CBD and cannabinoids are effective for pain. That has been demonstrated in multiple systematic reviews and meta-analyses, including one from the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine, but even one published in JAMA. And we see that time and time again, there's not a whole lot of controversy that cannabinoids are effective in treating pain. So this is the fifth vital sign we have to treat pain. Number two, this is something that is safe to add to an opioid regimen. The nice human, co human pharmacokinetic studies show us that CBD and cannabinoids do not increase the, rate, the risk of respiratory depression that opioids bring. They don't increase the risk of negative cardiovascular complications from opioids. So we can add this to a regimen without um, you know, just increasing that risk, unlike a benzo or unlike increasing uh, the opioid dose. Third, withdraw. There's some really interesting human trials that show that CBD actually reduces physiological withdrawal symptoms in humans when they're withdrawing from opioids. Certainly a major barrier to getting off of these narcotic medications is that withdrawal can be uh, really unpleasant to say the least. And when we have something on board that's not only safe, but is treating the pain and actually contributes to reducing withdrawal symptoms, that's a win-win. And what's really nice is you're not going to ever withdraw from CBD. The World Health Organization put out a report in 2018 that said CBD is safe, it's well tolerated, it is not associated with negative public health outcomes, meaning this isn't just substituting one addictive product for another. You, you can't withdraw from CBD, you can't become dependent on it. Um, really an excellent safety profile here. And lastly, uh, when there's substance use disorder, if there's dual diagnosis, CBD is um, really being considered as a novel therapeutic agent for substance use disorder treatment. Really nice preclinical models as well, where um, CBD reduces drug-seeking behavior in these addicted animals, but also um, we're seeing this in human studies as well. So uh, the, we can send these slides around, but here's just a summary of those meta-analyses and systematic reviews I've discussed. And the pharmacokinetic study, this is safe to add to your opioid withdrawal or opioid regimen. So people are using CBD when they're in pain. Um, again, whether we are recommending it as practitioners or not. This is from last year, seven pain clinics in Southern California. Over half, over 60% of those in these pain clinics said that they have tried a CBD product. Um, almost 40% of them use CBD products. CBD products that contain no THC. And they are saying it helps them and it reduces their pain medication. So over 60% said it reduced their pain medication and over 40% said it reduced their opioid medication. And they're using this for all sorts of different pain ideologies as well. So we see a lot of these reports. That's not the only one, that's just really the most recent. We see this out of Maine, we see it out of Michigan, we see it out of New York, we see it from actually the Centers uh, for Medicaid and Medicare across the country that opioid reduction happens or is at least reported to happen uh, with CBD on board. The problem is these are self-report studies. Uh, so whoever elects to actually fill out the survey is a self-selected group. 
there is a variable dosing. We don't know if people are taking three milligrams or 300 milligrams, and we don't know if they're taking a hemp-derived product that probably has enough THC in it to be effective for pain, but it's certainly going to be a different experience than a marijuana product with very high THC. We don't know um, the delivery. We don't know if people are inhaling, if they're vaping, if they're using it under their tongue, if they're using it topically, et cetera. So there's major data limitations with what we see out there. It's all very promising, but there's a lot of gaps to fill. So what we did at Ananda, um, and again, we provide biotics with their oil. We looked at CBD use and particularly the hemp extract that's in the FS15 soft gels and the FS20 tincture. And we looked at chronic pain patients in Appalachia and we tried to see, will um, bringing our oil on board reduce their opioids in a short amount of time, eight weeks, and what will it do to their quality of life? So this was really designed to open label. It couldn't be randomized because when we started the trial in late 2018, the FDA hadn't opened that up yet. So it was more observational. Uh, still, we did some really specific data collection to close some of the gaps I just mentioned. So one, uh, we looked at opioid use and found that over half of the study's participants and 97 participants com completed the study, over half of them actually reduced their opioid use in just eight weeks, 53%. 94% um, of those who choose to use the hemp extract reported quality of life improvements. And I will mention that um, because this was an open label design, basically everybody chose to use hemp extract, um, only two participants did not use it. So of those who used it, over half reduced their opioids, 94% reported quality of life improvements. And these were statistically significant uh, improvements in sleep and pain using validated instruments that we used at baseline four weeks and eight weeks. So this was really promising. We knew that uh, there was again, an opportunity to limit opioid use and also just improve quality of life in these patients who are having um, a really hard time with chronic disease. Now, um, what's also interesting is that these medications, um, some of them were not short acting and they couldn't reduce them. So some of these participants were on something like a fentanyl patch and maybe they weren't improving their opioid use, but they were getting out, they were exercising, they were feeling better, they were reducing or eliminating their benzos or their sleep meds. So there was a lot of, you know, wins in my mind, even if they weren't able to reduce their opioids. Now, this study was a first in a lot of ways. It was the first one to use a uh, hemp-derived over-the-counter or practitioner-only oil. And outside of survey studies, this is the largest study to date. You know, we see a lot of these uh, studies with 12 or 13 people at the most. Um, this had 97 participants complete the study. They're using a uniform product. They were using all FS15 soft gels. And we were recording the dose. Almost all of the participants used 30 milligrams a day or two soft gels a day. Almost all of them split it into two doses. There was a small handful who just used two at night. Um, most other studies who looked at something like this, they used doses that were super therapeutic. Now that's great, so we understand safety profile, sure, but you don't need that much CBD or hemp extract to uh, get the results again. So 30 milligram dose, almost across the board. Small handful used only 15 milligrams or one soft gel a day. And there was one participant who used four soft gels a day. They were all using it orally. Um, and we know that the cannabinoid content and the content across the board was consistent over time. Again, that's what we're not seeing from research. So this is really nice and was just published in the Journal of Postgraduate Medicine in November. The print edition came out in January and it is available online for you to read the full study. Now there's some limitations here. Obviously this wasn't randomized um, and really speaks to a need for clinical education at the practitioner front and specifically within pain clinics that we are not drug testing these participants because that small amount of THC could lead to a failed drug test and that could get these patients kicked out of their clinics. So whether we are managing pain as practitioners or we're collaborating with 
other providers who are pain management specialists for our patients, we really need to talk to them about eliminating um, THC testing in their drug screens um, or not kicking patients out if they do test positive, if they admit to using these full spectrum products or doing a more sophisticated test that's not an immunoassay test. It's something like a blood test that can really quantify the level of THC. And you know, an informed uh, set of eyes can look at it and say, this is clearly a hemp product and not a marijuana product if that's something you're worried about. So I talk about sexual health as well because you know, I, I hesitate. I hate talking only about pain when we talk about women's health, right? We always talk about pain, but the reality is there's there's a lot of uh, pain issues in women's health, particularly endometriosis. But there's also an opportunity for pleasure here. And I think if we see that as holistic providers, this is really part of someone leading a happy, healthy, full life. So the ECS has an abundance of receptors in reproductive tissue, particularly in female reproductive tissue. So there's a great opportunity to reduce pain and inflammation whether that's from endometriosis or just postpartum or postmenopausal dryness um, or other mechanisms, but also to increase libido, to increase pleasure and to really lead to orgasm. That's what we're seeing from these studies. So I hope that this is part of your patient's life that you're talking about and um, ingesting cannabinoids 30 minutes to an hour before sexual activity has been shown to increase satisfaction and decrease pain. Um, so definitely an opportunity here. And again, the endocannabinoid system and endocannabinoids really regulate everything from folliculogenesis to endometrial proliferation when it comes to um, these tissues. And I just want to mention that this survey of 373 women, the uh, use of cannabinoids before sexual activity more than doubled the report of satisfactory orgasm. Um, so. Uh, Again, I hope you're talking about that with your patients, but if you're not, these are you know, really great products to help them achieve that if they want to. And again, I can send these slides out, but this is just a summary of the different clinical trials to date and the outcomes they've seen as far as endometriosis using cannabinoids. So what do you need to know? If you are recommending these products to patients, what do you need to know? And I'm gonna go over um, a lot of this, I certainly can't touch on everything with the time we have today, but I think dosing is the most important. So one, again, this bell-shaped dose response curve you see on the left-hand side, you want to find the peak without, you know, going over it. Less is more. With the biotics products, I recommend that you start at 10 milligrams under the tongue. That's going to be the FS20 oil. So that's half a dropper full, half an ml. Start at 10 milligrams under the tongue. That's going to be comparable to one of the FS15 soft gels, and that's due to first pass effect. So uh, if you use one of the soft gels, it's going to have a delayed onset and a, and a prolonged um, effect because this goes to the GI system, goes through first pass metabolism. You're going to lose about 30% of active to first pass effect. Um, that's fine. This is safe, but you know, some people even want to use that because they may not have as much trouble falling asleep, but they have trouble staying asleep. That's a nice opportunity for a soft gel because it has that prolonged effect. Also, some people just um, really don't like a tincture under the tongue or they want to be very, very specific about um, how much they're taking. And that's easy to do with a soft gel. Now, the tincture under the tongue is going to bypass first pass effect. You're going to get a more rapid onset and you won't lose some of that active ingredients. So you want to go 30% less, 10 milligrams, to start with the tincture. I recommend people start at night, one to two hours before bedtime. And that's because one, they'll get a great night's sleep. But two, if they have any sort of side effects, it's particularly drowsiness, they're not going out to start their day. They're not going to work. It's not a big deal. They can assess how this makes them feel. And then they can decide whether or not they're a good candidate, along with you, for BID or TID dosing. Some people are not, and they really need to um, use one larger dose just at night. So then I ask people, my patients, to go up uh, slowly and titrate up every two to three days. Now, if you're using a soft gel, you can only go up in 15 milligram increments. That's fine. Um, but again, you won't have as much wiggle room with that as you will with the tincture. 
And with the tincture, you can go up by five or 10 milligram increments. You know your patients best. So see what you know, level of patience they have, number one. Um, but also you know, evaluate if there's someone who's really sensitive to different substances. This is something maybe to really slowly and incrementally increase. So every two to three days, increase the dose as desired. So you're going up the hill, you're climbing up to the peak. Once you add a little bit more and you either feel the same as you did on the lower dose or you feel a little bit worse, that means you're at the top or you're starting to come down the other side, go back to the previous dose. So this is certainly personalized medicine. I would love to give you dosing guidelines across conditions, but there is not evidence based for that. I will tell you that in our studies uh, and in our observation with these particular products from Biotics, the therapeutic range for almost all of your patients is going to be between 10 and 60 milligrams a day. I usually say between 10 and 40, but that's for the oil. Um, it's really between 10 and 60 if you're including the soft gels there, as you should be. Above that, it's going to be very rare that you need to have someone who needs more than that. Um, and if you have someone on 60 milligrams a day for a week and they're not getting any effect, that's your rare person who just doesn't respond to this. That will happen. It's certainly rare, but that's really my cutoff threshold. Um, so we say start low, go slow does take some time and it's a relatively narrow therapeutic window with these particular products. Um, you may see dosing out there that's much, much higher in the literature that's going to be isolated CBD and again, a super therapeutic dose. As far as topical with the roll-on, just apply to the effective area as needed. Um, you're not going to overdose on this. There is some systemic uptake with topical application, but it's relatively limited. Um, so I, I would not, be overly concerned about uh, topical dosing. Just apply to the effective area as needed. And, and remember that topicals are really a nice adjunct to oral or sublingual. So if I have someone, let's say, with psoriatic arthritis or eczema, um, I have them use a sublingual or an oral day to day to reduce uh, frequency and severity of flares. But when they do get something like that, to use the topical as an adjunct throughout uh, the day, throughout the month, et cetera. A topical is also a nice entry point for someone who may have trepidation to this, and then they really like the topical, so they become more open to trying a sublingual or an oral. Um, topicals, you know, localized pain, inflammation, even just, you know, I throw it in my bag after I go to the gym and just use it for um, some muscle recovery as well. What about drug interactions? So these compounds do interact with CYP450 enzymes. What we are seeing is that it is dose dependent. Really everything here is dose dependent. 20 milligrams per kilogram a day is the magic number where we see increase in side effects, increase in liver toxicity, and clinically significant drug interactions. Now, remember, I said that people are really between 10 and 60 milligrams total a day, not per kilogram. So you should be well below this threshold with these biotics products. Um, you know, that being said, certainly if your patient's on some blood thinners and, and there's a potential for interaction, just make sure they know, monitor them, um, don't be too cavalier. But there is no, there is not even case reports of these low doses causing drug interactions. So you know, you can be cautiously optimistic that below 20 mg per keg a day, you don't need to worry. And what about vulnerable populations with pediatric patients? Um, this is certainly not FDA approved, but a lot of colleagues out there, they use their starting dose as weight dependent. I wanna remind you that in adults, I do not recommend weight dependent dosing. I do not see that um, to be effective. So you may have someone who's 80 pounds soaking wet and she needs that upper limit of, of 60 plus a day milligrams. Um, and you may have a 200 pound patient who is uh, doing really, really, really well on 10 milligrams a day. So I don't see uh, a nice opportunity for weight-based dosing in adults, but in pediatrics, the general rule of thumb is 0.2 milligrams per kilogram a day. Um, and you can split that into two doses. Um, 
far as HIV positive patients, there's some literature out there that even though uh, they would certainly be immunocompromised, and this is an anti-inflammatory agent and an immunomodulator, it's really adaptogenic. It does not, um, you know, reduce an unhealthy immune system, making our vulnerable populations or even our healthy populations more susceptible to disease. And there's some nice studies on uh, T4 cell counts that do demonstrate that in HIV positive patients, and that can certainly translate to other immunocompromised patients. So, you know, this is a word that I, I have really learned from the functional medicine uh, community, but CBD and hemp extract is really adaptogenic, and, and that's exciting for all of us. Will people fail a drug test? Possibly. So your patients will ask you this. The full spectrum products, so the FS15, FS20, these are going to be the most effective, but they do have a risk of failing a drug test. And that's really because that small amount of THC is lipophilic. It's a very clingy molecule. It can build up in someone's system over time, and they could certainly fail a drug test because that's what they look for is THC. Now, even if you used a product without any THC in it, or even if they didn't take very much of it, there's a risk of cross-reactivity with those urine and saliva screens. Um, that can cause a false positive. So even if you use a product without THC, there's still that risk. And what SAMHSA, they even recommend that you do a confirmation test if someone fails a drug screening and an immunoassay test. And they say that it'll look at a level of 15 nanograms per ml in serum. And that is their cutoff threshold for intoxication. Now there's some controversy around that, but I do think it's a generally good rule of thumb um, to ask your patient's employers to do that as follow-up if they need to uh, take a drug test for work. I certainly tell people to be more proactive than reactive with this and you know, tell their employers, tell their pain management specialists, whoever might be drug testing them, that they are taking these products. They have been recommended and provided by their practitioners. Um, they are federally legal, but there is a risk of failing a drug test. And usually people are much more open to um, working with them than if they just fail a drug test and they didn't know about it at first. What about use in pregnancy and breastfeeding? We don't have a lot of human data. It's not the case generally with pregnancy and breastfeeding. Um, but in animals, we know that use of cannabidiol was not dangerous until much higher levels. So 125 milligrams per kilogram a day or 250 milligrams per kilogram a day. Um, that is so far below what your patients would be on. But again, I can't guarantee that there's no negative outcomes because we don't have that data in humans, um, but certainly the animal data is reassuring. And I like to look at this as a harm reduction um, opportunity. You know, is this something that is helping mama because we want mama to be healthy? And is it a lower risk than something like a benzo or an opioid or even particular SSRIs or SNRIs that may be contraindicated in pregnancy and lactation? Now, what we do know in humans is that CBD and THC, they get into breast milk, and that's not surprising. I mean, they're lipophilic molecules, and a lot of things get into breast milk, but um, at very low doses, so really, really low concentration. And the ingested dose via breast milk is about a 1,000 times lower than mom's ingested dose, at least of delta-9 THC. We can assume it's pretty comparable uh, with CBD. And the relevant infant dose is 2.5% maternal dose. Now, across the board, as far as drugs go, we want our relative infant dose to be below 10%. That's generally considered safe, so this is 2.5%. Um, number one. Number two, it doesn't matter. You know, THC does have some risks to the developing brain, and probably only at high, high doses. It can risk um, delayed maturation of the frontal lobe. CBD, though, does not delay maturation of the frontal lobe in the developing brain because it doesn't act on those receptors in the prefrontal cortex the same way that THC does. So um, these very, very low doses are possibly in breast milk for a lactating um, mother, but doesn't matter. We don't really know. Um, though many of us think probably not, but again, I can't guarantee. So that's something, here's the information, do with it what you will, talk to your patients and make an informed decision together. And lastly, I just wanna to touch on 
the wild west of the CBD market. Um, it really is the wild west out there. This is not regulated. And so what do you do? You ask for a certificate of analysis and people are, are and companies are providing these more often, but they're kind of bogus, some of them, unfortunately. You wanna make sure that the COA is done by an ISO certified lab, that that lab is truly third party, that they're testing for potency, uh, and they're also testing for purity, looking at pesticides, microbes, molds, uh, solvents, et cetera, and then it's lot specific. I see a lot of companies putting out these sample COAs, and it's like, does it reflect what's in my hand or in this product? I have no idea. Um, and what Biotics has actually done for you, we at Ananda are very thorough in our quality assurance. We provide lot specific COAs for all of our products. We test in-house. We load a third party labs that meet all of these um, criteria that I just mentioned. And then when we send our FS products to Biotics, they then go to another ISO certified lab and they double check for you. Um, which, you know, is, is costing everybody a little bit more money and, and taking everyone's very valuable time. But this is really important, particularly in this unregulated industry, that we don't recommend something that could put our patients at risk or even just, you know, make them feel taken advantage of if, if it's not something that truly has active ingredients in it as we're promising. So these FS products, yes, they've been tested by us over at Ananda Health, but they've then again been put through, um, some rigorous testing by Biotics and through Eurofins labs as well. So um, you can ask them for it and how to do it, but each of the products will have a lot number on it. You can uh, type in that lot number at the certificate of analysis page and that will pop up. And you can also scan the QR code on every single product. And then the COA webpage will come up, type in the lot number below the QR code, and you will find the third party uh, test validating all of these products for you and for your patients. So thank you. That was a lot. We went through a lot today. There's so much more to cover. Um, but again, I know you're all very busy. So thank you for being with me. And I want to take your questions. So I have a question here that says, what's the difference between broad spectrum and full spectrum? And that is, is a great question. And the only difference is broad spectrum doesn't have any THC in it. It's completely eliminated traces of THC. Full spectrum would have a little bit of THC in it. Uh, that's important because THC is really the star player in the entourage effect. So we want that little bit of THC, but there are some people who can't afford to have any THC in their systems and have that risk of truly failing a drug test. So for those folks, they may choose a broad spectrum product. Next question. You mentioned dry mouth. What about dry eyes? Is that possibly a side effect? Yes, uh, very rare, but it can happen. There's a little bit of anticholinergic uh, possibilities here with uh, full spectrum products, particularly with that small amount of THC. I don't see it very often, but it can happen with Delta 9. Mm, okay. I have a question here about uh, cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. And what's interesting is that that is really uh, put on by THC and can actually be counteracted by CBD. So we don't really see that at all with hemp derived CBD products where the CBD is that much uh, greater in ratio to the THC. And um, that question follow up is, is whether or not K2 spice mold pesticides, um, for those of you who don't know K2 or spice, those are synthetic cannabinoids that have um, caused some pretty scary health issues. And they're sold at you know bodegas in, in New York and, and different cities. So uh, were there, present during these cases, the hyperemesis cases. I'm actually not sure of that answer. There was certainly uh, something known as a zombie apocalypse in Bushwick in Brooklyn uh, due to K2 and spice. So, uh, and, and we also saw some pretty scary cases of GI bleeding outside of Texas due to these synthetic cannabinoids. So again, avoid synthetic at all costs, um, but I'm not sure if hyperemesis issues were because of those. I, I haven't heard any case studies about that. Let's see, next questions. 
You can get the slides, yes. A lot of you have asked if you can have the slides, and you certainly can. Um, I will make sure to make them available to you all. Another question is uh, if there's any legal issues with selling full-spectrum CBD products that contain 0.3% THC or less. No, at the federal level, there is um, there are no issues. The Farm Bill uh, you know, made this completely legal across the country. You just want to make sure that the THC level is in fact within that um, threshold. And certainly with the COA from Biotics, that will prove that you are not accidentally selling or reselling something that is above that THC threshold because then technically that's a felony. So again, you wanna make sure you're getting this from a very trusted provider. The absorption of the tincture versus soft gels, um, it's gonna be about a third more, 30% more absorption with sublingual versus soft gels. That's why you wanna dose a little bit higher with the soft gels versus the oil. The safest way to introduce CBD to an opioid regimen, I recommend introducing CBD for a month, using it as an adjunct for a month. We can avoid respiratory depression risk, cardiovascular risk, et cetera, when adding to an opioid regimen. But if you're trying to help someone titrate down eventually, I want CBD on board for at least 30 days. Um, I want them to find it to be well tolerated, um, to get used to it. And then I would titrate down according to whatever protocol I would use without an adjunct. And to me, CBD is really just there to um, help increase the, the chances of success. And I've seen it a lot of times. I always mention that you'll have, you know, like one star patient who comes in a week later and is completely off their uh, opioids or they're reporting they no longer need their methadone. And that's great, but that is the rare, rare, rare outlier. Um, really, I want this on for a month and then slowly titrate down. And this is a, an adjunct to help. Is a tincture form better than capsule or edible? I prefer tinctures because they're, um, you know, more bioavailable than the capsule. And also they have that more rapid onset but some people just prefer the capsule. So it's, it's really up to working with your individualized patient and what they want. It's also a little bit easier to dose uh, specifically with capsules or edibles, but with tinctures, you have uh, more wiggle room to play around with specific dosing. Will a urine drug screen come up positive when taking broad spectrum CBD oil? It's possible to get a false positive on an immunoassay test. So a urine drug screen is often immunoassay. And broad spectrum can uh, trigger a false positive due to cross-reactivity of other cannabinoids with THC. In that case, you ask for a confirmation test through serum. If it is truly broad spectrum and there is no THC in it, that confirmation test will always be negative. There's no risk of cross-reactivity there. An example of synthetic cannabinoids, uh, spice or K2, but honestly, even Marinol or Dronabinol that are FDA-approved medications, those are synthetic cannabinoids. Let's see. Do people taking CBD build up a resistance and need to take a higher dose over time? They do not build a resistance to CBD, at least not at these levels. Um, there's a possibility at much, much, much higher levels that you will not see your uh, patients taking, and that's only been demonstrated with animals at incredibly high levels. But you can build up a tolerance to THC, and that can make uh, people want to increase their dose over time. It, if they stop for even, 24 to 48 hours and do that quick two-day washout, that will reset things and eliminate their tolerance pretty quickly. The research regarding CBD to help reduce blood pressure, it's a pretty mild reduction in blood pressure. I've seen some really nice um, success with this, but it is a mild vasodilator. It's also really just an adaptogen, so it's going to decrease elevated blood pressure, but not necessarily make someone with a healthy blood pressure hypotensive. 
there are some cases where if someone is on multiple antihypertensives, I have seen mild hypotension with that. So if someone has a lot of blood pressure meds on board, this can help them reduce them potentially, but you want to be cautious at first to make sure they don't go too hypotensive. And again, that's only with medication on board, not without it. And the question about CBD is safe and well tolerated, you can't become dependent on it. That is from the WHO report from CBD isolate, not from full spectrum CBD under 0.3%. So this um, user said under 3%, that is a lot higher than 0.3%. I have never seen anyone um, become dependent on it and it's still very well tolerated at hemp derived levels. Um, there does not seem to be any sort of uh, risk or issue in the clinical community with this of those of us who practice regularly, but that WHO report was about isolated CBD. How do you get the slides? We will send them to you. And usage with high blood pressure, um, so I've gotten this question come through a few times. You can use it with high blood pressure certainly. But again, if you're if you have a patient on antihypertensive, then just watch the blood pressure, make sure they don't go too hypotensive when they start this. No, they have not received an NPN number from Health Canada. Uh, the use of CBD transdermal application, there is going to be more localized uptake, uh, but there is some systemic absorption. I often see where um, companies even say that topical or transdermal absorption does not um, result in systemic absorption. I don't know why they say that. Maybe for drug test questions to these people, but that's certainly not the case. This will get into the bloodstream, um, just not as at high of levels of an ingestible. I have tried to use CBD oil 25 milligrams BID for pain management, but my patient said they did not feel much pain relief. Is my dose too low for pain management? That dose, 25 milligrams BID, is often not too low for pain management. That is really in the sweet spot, but the difference, it's difficult for me to comment um, when I don't know what type of CBD oil it is. And again, this is certainly personalized medicine, but 50 milligrams total for the day split into two doses is again, really, really in that sweet spot from the oil that is used in biotics products. Um, so I, I don't know if you were talking about an isolate, a full spectrum, a broad spectrum, or if that CBD oil really had the milligrams of active cannabinoids reflected. Sometimes the milligrams seem to be of active cannabinoids, but they're actually of oil. And that oil can be anywhere from 50 to 80% active. So um, that's another thing to really look for is active cannabinoids, not just milligrams of oil. I have not used CBD with persistent genital arousal disorder. And I don't know of any patient um, like case studies with that, but it, I don't know. I'd have to think on that more. I wish I had a better answer for you. If you see my email and I can send it around to everyone, I'd like to talk about this a little bit further and do some research so we could talk offline about that. But no, I do not know any case studies right now. These products are not yet available in the UK, but we're working on it. Stay tuned. And experience with ADHD or autism and CBD. Yes. A lot of experience here. There's some nice studies that CBD actually reduces self-injurious behavior of uh, those with autism spectrum disorder and increases social interaction, improves social impairment. I think a lot of us, me included, uh, think of ADHD as really on the spectrum of autism spectrum disorders. So we are seeing improvements in both ADHD symptoms and autism spectrum disorders with CBD. Um, that is a possibility if it's a young patient to dose with 0.2 milligrams per kilogram a day, split into two doses if it's well tolerated. Again, that's 
very off label, but that is what many of my pediatric colleagues are using with a lot of success, and I have seen it in my practice as well. How does it prepare, compare to kava for anxiety? To be honest, I am not um, familiar enough with kava for anxiety to comment on this very well. I have a, a question about absorption and nanoproducts. I've had a lot of difficulty evaluating the claim of increased absorption with nanoproducts or, you know, these water soluble uh, claims. Certainly CBD is lipophilic, so it's very difficult to make it shelf stable when it's water soluble. And I've gone to many different chemists who haven't really seemed to solve this problem of shelf stability over time without adding a lot of preservatives or sugars to this. Um, and even then, it, it still really sticks to the sides of containers um, and can, you know, really change the molecule and render it no longer cannabidiol. Um, another thing is increased absorption, even if it, it is true, um, and I have seen some, some limited data, I'm, I'm yet to be convinced, it doesn't necessarily mean increased outcomes or improved outcomes. We see this bell-shaped dose response curve so uh, increased absorption within the cell really makes me quite a bit skeptical. Great. I just have a question on drug interactions and what the dose there is to, for clinical significance. And again, that's going to be 20 milligrams per kilogram a day in the literature. There's one published case study looking at an interaction with warfarin. And in that case study, there was a change in the INR, so suggested in an interaction at 10 milligrams per kilogram a day. It wasn't outside of therapeutic range, so it was not a dangerous interaction. That um, INR level jumped significantly, again, at that magic number of 20 milligrams per kilogram a day. I think it's also important to note that the provider in this case, the physician did not withdraw the CBD because the patient was responding well to it for what for its intended use. They simply um, adjusted the warfarin dose to um, accommodate the CBD just like they would other medications. So that is the only case study I know of where any interaction has been documented below 20 milligrams per kilogram a day. The difference between hemp-derived and marijuana-derived CBD um, really is one of legality. So if you are deriving CBD from, and it's isolated, from a hemp plant or a marijuana plant, it's, that's really just an issue of legality because it's going to be the same molecule. Now, it's all about ratios and percentages of THC within that oil. If the percent is 0.3% or less of THC, it's going to be considered hemp. Um, I think there's a lot of debate out there about you know, what's better, but it's really about what makes up the oil. Now, there are some criticisms that hemp-derived CBD oil, when it's considered full spectrum, because there's not a hard and fast definition of full spectrum other than that has a little bit of THC in it. It may not have any other cannabinoids, terpenes or flavonoids in it because hemp is very difficult to grow well and um, good genetics are, are hard to come by. So there's a little bit of an argument from um, those who use marijuana derived CBD that they have more robust variety in their compounds contributing to the entourage effect. That is true of some marijuana versus hemp, but um, this particular extract found in the Biotics FS products um, is really, really varied. And you can see that on the certificates of analysis that there's going to be a lot of terpenes, flavonoids, and multiple cannabinoids in each oil. If it is called hemp derived, will it have THC? It certainly can, up to 0.3%. It is not available in Canada. Um, will they cross the border easily? You can, they're fully legal in the US, but I don't know 
Um, I think Canada is limiting really anything that comes across the border. So I, I wish I had a better answer for that, but I, I'm not sure. Um, tinctures can not be added to, oh, can it be added to water or a smoothie? They certainly can be added. Um, again, that root of administration, you're going to lose some to first pass metabolism. It would be very similar to taking a soft gel. The CBD oil, it depends on the route of administration. Again, um, it will have a very rapid onset with the tincture within 30 minutes, with the soft gels within two hours. The tincture will last, um, the duration is typically about four to six hours, whereas with the soft gel, it's going to be about six to eight hours. Oh, I. I'm not sure if I understand this question correctly. When you gave your milligram recommendations, what amount of CBD were you talking about? A thousand milligram bottle with about 800 milligrams of CBD in the bottle. My recommendations are active cannabinoids, um, which will be majority cannabidiol in these products. So between 80 and 90% CBD, but I, my dosing recommendations are active cannabinoids uh, total, and that is going to be reflected on the FS product, so you can uh, um, determine that pretty easily. Nitroglycerin combined with CBD topicals, wonderful in sexual dysfunction or painful issues. I agree, thank you for that comment. This is uh, an ethanol extraction. It then goes through, these products are extracted via ethanol extraction, and then there are um, multiple steps of distillation and tests for lack of residual solvents in all of the COAs. And if um, there were any residual solvents in the product, it would never go to market. Are biotics products considered organic? Are there organic CBD products? So it's a little tricky because the biotics products, what's inside of them, yes, could be considered organic um, because you only have to have, I believe what it's 97% or 98% organic um, material to be considered organic in your product. The issue is the cannabinoids and the hemp are not, the extract is not considered organic. So we felt that it was a little misleading to slap organic on the label. The hemp is certainly farmed with organic pro, um, processes and meets all of the guidelines. It's just to actually get the stamp of organic farming for hemp right now is close to impossible. There is one small farm in Colorado that has it. Um, that's it. So everything else is organic and it is farmed organically. There are certainly no synthetics used on these plants whatsoever, and I can test it up, but um, we don't have the organic um, certification for the farm. Okay, I think we've gotten to, I hope I'm using this correctly, all of your questions, and I'm going to look through some of the ones that I didn't have um, answers for. And if there's anything else, please send them my way. And I will send you all out a comprehensive review of all these great questions. So thank you so much for staying with me a little over time today.